This is what it looks like if you haven't had a chance to read it yet today, the National Planning Policy Framework. And um, I will uh, just spend a minute, uh, I'm a planner, but I won't default to planning speak. I will spend just a minute uh, uh, covering up the fact that some of you won't yet have had a chance to read this by just giving you a little position on it, um, and my perspective on what has transpired here. Um, first, it seems to me it's inescapable as a matter of fact that the town and country planning system was not working by the time we had that big election. No matter how you add it up, the housing starts had fallen. Uh, the last figure I saw was the same level as, as 1910. And we were dysfunctional in almost <coughs> all respects as a community, you know, housing and accommodating our enterprises. So it wasn't working. So something had to be done. We then got the, um, uh, the creation of the unelected uh, coalition government personal view of this, and um, they decided that it should be to uh, dismantle the system as it was and try and create a different one, so that's the scene. A group of four people, uh, I know one of them was John Rhodes, who's a very good planner, and as a meteoric company called uh, Quad he's founded, was one of them. There were three others, and I confess I don't know their names, we were given the jo job of writing the draft of a national planning policy framework on 50 pages, not more than 50 sides, to replace, which was, until uh, last night when we went to bed, 1,337 pages of policy. Uh, park for you a moment the thought about whether quantity matters. You know, it doesn't really matter whether it's 50 pages or 1,300, but from a political debating point, you can see where they were coming from. The draft MPPF was published uh, earlier last year, and uh, for reasons that I still don't understand, I mean, no, I understand entirely the reasons, but with a publicity degree that I don't understand, um, the National Trust and the CPRE, um, who have co-related uh, people in them, um, decided that this was this draft MPPF was going to lead to the concreting over of national parks, etc. Do you remember? Extremely exaggerated. Um, uh, representation of what was proposed in my view to the point of being you know jaw-droppingly odd but anyway they whipped it up the Daily Telegraph joined in and set up a campaign uh, the campaign to save our land which is a very interesting concept uh, they mean the campaign to save your land not their land they don't own it um, but anyway the campaign to save our land and so Fiona Reynolds and others then spent the best part of a year now uh, getting us all terribly excited that the draft National Planning Policy Framework was the end of all life as we would know it. The final draft then emerged um, uh, yesterday, and it looks like that. And uh, there are three or four major changes in the text due to the politics of what has transpired. The first is that the um, uh, phrase sustainable development, which was used in the draft without explanation, is now defined. And it is, they've taken it, what a big deal. They've taken the definition from the UK government sustainable development strategy, which is still extant. And so they didn't have to invent a phrase, it was hanging there all the time. So why on earth they didn't put it in the first draft and save themselves a lot of bother, I don't know. But sustainable development is now defined, and it's what you would expect it to be. It is the three legged stool of social, environmental, and economic considerations to be held in some sort of internal tension and the weight shifted from leg to leg of this stool according to where you are and what you're dealing with. So that's one big change. Uh, a second big change is that the, um, uh, although there is to be a, a presumption in favour of proposals which are sustainable development, they've now sort of put back in a load of words saying only if, uh, that, that only applies if there isn't an up-to-date local plan, and they've added some really worrying bits about, or, or an old local plan which has relevant bits in it. So, you know, so indeed, a charter for lawyers. But a definition of sustainable development, a positive presumption in favour of things that are sustainable development, if there isn't an up-to-date plan that uh, would say otherwise. And um, the uh, third feature of it, which is explained a little more, is what they call the duty to cooperate. Mm -hmm. Having demolished, <coughs> not in law actually, soon, but not yet in law, having abandoned the regional planning strategy work in England and therefore left nowhere for anybody to go to talk about anything other than the local. 
They now require local authorities to cooperate with their neighbouring authorities to deal with larger area things. It's a really awkward place they've got themselves in. It's obvious that we're going to have to get back to some sort of strategic arrangement sooner rather than later. But for the moment, uh, Littlesville here has got to cooperate with Bigsville next door and jointly plan their way ahead. This, if you inhabit the Middle England, as mostly I do these days, you will know this is impossible. It is inconceivable that Northampton and South Northamptonshire, or Oxford and South Oxfordshire, or Milton Keynes and Aylesbury Valley, you, you all know something. It's inconceivable that they can cooperate. And we heard today uh, a, a minute had been sent across from the department to the Town and Country Planning Association saying, uh, what we mean to say is that um, they must show they have tried to cooperate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and a memorandum setting out the things on which they disagree would be sufficient. Uh, see, they're making up for the So there we are. We had a draft to clear away the baggage. The draft has been modified to sort of placate some of the voices of criticism and is better for it. And uh, if I may express a personal interest and excitement. They've also, for reasons I don't entirely understand, said that it's a jolly good idea if cooperating authorities from time to time decide to create a new settlement or major development area, um, in which case they should follow the principles of garden cities. Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> Ghost of Ebenezer Howard. <laughs> Back of the room. Um, and the truth of the matter is, uh, kind of, this government has latched on to garden cities over the last time in a way you won't be aware of and the academy ought to be aware of because sometimes garden cities are held up to be the antithesis of urbanism. Mm -hmm. Well known polar. Mm -hmm. But remember this, Grant Shapps, the Housing Minister, MP for Well in Garden City, right? <laughs> <laughs> First building brick. And then garden cities sound nicer than new towns or new settlements. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also a pair of words <coughs> they don't have to use the Labour government's pair of words, which were actually very powerful. Eco towns. So they sort of found themselves backed into this thing. And this says, I shan't uh, linger now, says um, uh, if you want to build garden cities, it's a jolly good thing and you should follow the principles of garden cities. I'm very sure they don't know what the principles of garden cities are. <laughs> the first of which is the common ownership of all the land in perpetuity. <laughs> so that the rise of land value is captured by the people that live there. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, they, <laughs> tonight's debate, Academy of Urbanism, what does this mean for what subject brings us together tonight? And I, look, I'm not negative about this. In a clumsy, clunky, ignorant kind of way, uh, this bunch of people have slashed a load of bureaucratic windbagging out of the way. It needed to be got rid of, it was repetitive, overcomplicated, and it was the vested industry of a, sorry, the vested interest of an industry of people trying to make life complicated and uh, make themselves important, in my opinion. Um, and what they've constructed for the time being, as long as it holds, is a system where the weight of the power and the responsibility for placemaking is now to rest with the elected local authority, which is where, you know, in most of Europe it is, uh, and um, also then, unfortunately, the, t the sentence then becomes weak because it is also to rest with uh, neighbourhood plans. Um, I'm not going to dwell on neighbourhood plans because there's a very complicated procedure. It'll take two years, it'll take £100,000. Nobody will complete the circle as the, you know, the process. It's a very odd thing. The only people who are doing neighbourhood neighbor plans are people who are trying to stop things. You know, It's just tonight. I don't think the Academy should expect neighbourhood plans to be a very productive area or creative design work and placemaking. In my opinion, challenge me in discussion. So let's just concentrate on the local authority. You make a plan, boys, it's up to you. No more guidance, no hiding room. You've got it, you know your housing numbers, you know the jobs you've got to create. It's your patch, you do it in any way you like, but you do it. But you've got to do it in pursuit of the principles of sustainable urban development. Sustainable development, rather, which is good. Um, and that if you don't get on with it, then the private sector might bring in proposals and we will approve them over your head if you dilly-dally. I don't think that's a bad thing. And I would say that um, what it means while it runs in 
practice is that one of these eternal truths happens. If you are involved, I mean, I'm a, I'm a private sector consultant. If one's involved in a project which is wholesome in its conception and its content, you know, it's a worthy, intelligent, beautiful thing, well considered, and located in a sensible place, you know, whatever that may be, whether it's brownfield land or <coughs> transportation into that intersection or whatever it is, a place where the market wants to be rather than the old gas works behind the rubbish dump, you know, in a good place, it seems to me this system should allow us to get a lot further, faster, than the old system did. Conversely, if you're asked to work on something which is rather cynically ugly or awful or cheap, or they're getting you to perform as the master planner, but actually as soon as you've got the planning permission, you're out the door and in come the, you know, the project managers with the Gantt charts. I think they'll be found out. I, I, I'm hopeful that a good thing, well crafted, well argued, well presented and well considered, and with a management and a narrative about how it's to be made and maintained in perpetuity, will go further faster than before. But I've finished then with uh, two uh, uh, last contributions. I don't think local government is equipped to handle this responsibility, this freedom, this liberty. I don't think they have the time, the money, the mental space, or uh, it's in faculty which would sound in, in, in insulting, but I don't think that, that whole system of governance in our England is any more, it's atrophied, it's been weakened, chipped away at, it is merely a branch office of central government. And to make speeches as Greg Clark does, the localism minister, about we're now empowering you guys, you've got no money, no powers, no staff, no knowledge, no data, no nothing, <laughs> is a really shallow um, thing, and that really will be found out. And, and lastly, that um, with this focus on the local and the localism, <laughs> What is missing in here, and this I do feel very strongly about, is any discussion about how local expresses itself. I know when I go to a local council meeting, I see a row of fat, middle-aged white men looking remarkably like me, <laughs> all discussing where houses, which they've already got, or jobs which they've had, uh, should be located and doing all they can to do away with them all together or put them in the most awkward and ugly places they can think of. I know when I'm watching those 27 people at 11 o'clock on a Friday night in February, <laughs> I know there's another you know, 240,000 people that elect them who need houses and need jobs and need health care and, and, and buses and all the other paraphernalia of life whose voice is not heard. And I was hoping Know, finish now. I was hoping that one thing that would have been added to this, we campaigned for it at the TCPA, was more about, in the old jargon, statements of community involvement. Bring me a plan, prepare me a plan, but you must prove to me with it, with a report, that you have heard the silent, you know, the, sorry, the, the quiet voices. You've gone out of your way to talk to people to counterbalance the predominance in our <coughs> civic life in England of those who have are deciding things for those that have it. Mm -hmm. yeah.